Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the uh, fourth edition of um, Air Hacks um, each first Monday of the month. And this is actually not the interactive show rather than I recorded this um, another time. And the reason for this was we had some problems with the stream. So I rebooted my machine and forgot about the recordings. So um, instead, there was some corrupt files. So instead of attempting to repair the files, I would rather re-record the show. I hope it's okay. So there will be no interaction during the show. Okay, the first question was, are vanilla Java application actually viable? And this is not an actual question, rather than I was mentioned during a Twitter conversation and I actually had no idea um, uh, what what's the reason for the conversation was, but I will actually show you the um, the conversation. It was uh, uh, Theresa Raman uh, mentioned me and uh, said, ha has done the same as well, just vanilla Java applications. And the question was, uh, uh, Eberhard Wolf uh, looked for Wolf looked for uh, uh, years uh, without uh, libraries. Um, I don't know the reason, but the question is: Are such projects out there? And uh, the answer is, of course. <laughs> um, my only problem is I'm a consultant, so um, I cannot mention the projects, but I hope I will be able to uh, perform some interviews on my blog uh, soon um, with some startups using um, just vanilla Java. And recently I reviewed uh, several larger projects. So larger project means a um, couple of developers, I know 30 developers developed the projects for several years and the, um, and the uh, dependencies were negligible. So, um, so what it actually means, they just use um, uh, dependencies like Jakarta Commons, uh, uh, Dozer from time to time. So actually, um, you know, so nice to have dependencies. So we could actually eliminate all the dependencies without any impact on functionality. And what will remain is the vanilla Java E. So uh, the question is, um, what's my opinion about this? And my opinion is I like it. So what I really like is if we have Java E application server, just use it. And what it means is uh, try to keep the war small. So um, uh, in, the, in the Twitter, there were the ears were mentioned, but I didn't use uh, ears for years. So keep ear, uh, wars small. And uh, why it's important? Well, you can build in faster. You can build the wars um, easier. So there are no external dependencies. They are empty. Deployment is faster. So there's just benefits. And also the problem you can get with, um, with uh, external dependencies um, if they uh, they have to be maintained. So if any external dependency have to be maintained, what it actually means is uh, I would um, upgrade the dependency at least once a year. Um, and if you will, will be really sure, uh, you will have to check check out the source code, make it buildable inside your company, and then the um, and then you can be sure if that this dependency disappears. So um, what it actually means, someone you know push the delete button on GitHub, um, you can still um, uh, proceed with your application. So um, in my eyes, Java, applic Java applications are without any dependencies are absolutely viable. This is what I'm going for. If you look at my open source projects, which are just a pet projects, um, I try to minimize uh, uh, any uh, dependency um, Yeah, because of my mini minimalistic point of view. So if we have already a productive platform, why we should introduce you know, other dependencies? Exception from the rule is, of course, UI framework. So if you are using JSF, like prime faces, for instance, you will have to add the dependency. Okay. So the next question is uh, really interesting. What about exposing DB objects via REST directly? Um, answer is, um, if you can live with this, go for it. So um, what, what you will gain is if the database changes, your API changes, this um, uh, will change, which is actually a benefit. So um, um, why a benefit? Yeah, because um, um, uh, there is no uh, no duplication. So the truth in the database, if it changes, uh, all the clients have to be recompiled or at least uh, extended or some or or at least tested. And um, but be before you are implementing this, I would rather look at uh, the project Jest from OpenJPA. It's a nice servlet which directly exposes um, JPA object as uh, RESTful uh, web services. And the same is true for um, for uh, Eclipse Link, the project called JPARS, 
RESTful data services. And uh, what I really nice, like is also the API. It's really nice. So if you are learning REST, just look at the API. There are some nice principles of so post and put is used uh, properly. And, uh, you know, there are nice uh, uh, speaking or or affluent URIs, I would say. So you can just looking at the uh, at the URI, you know what is going on. So before, if you if you are thinking of exposing, you know, master data management to your database, I would rather look at uh, Eclipse Link JPA RS and Open JPA just before I would implement it by myself, or just clone the code, look at the code, modify the code, and contribute back. Okay, third question. I have uh, Java 6 app applications that communicate with um, uh, EJBs, JAX, WS, and JAXRS. And there are server-side applications and there are Swing clients or, 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 or Java clients involved. Um, and the question is where to put shared classes. So the first question is, do we need shared classes? So if you have a JAX, JAX WS, the common interface is WSDL. So you could generate the classes on each build uh, at the client side. This is actually what I did. If you're using JAXRS, you will probably go in the not non-type safe way. So what, what, what it means is you will expose JSON objects. So the common API is a JSON object. So um, the broader topic is type safe versus uh, dynamic interfaces. And we spent a couple of hours actually, or a couple of hours, yeah. Uh, in worst case, a couple of hours during the architecture day at Munich Airport, just discussing the topic, you know, what is better, type safe or not type safe. And um, it really de it really depends. This is the uh, consultant answer, it depends on your needs. But um, so it could have, you have nothing in common except uh, the REST API or WSDL. So this would be, uh, uh, would mean you are creating the server side code and the clients are created by a different department with different lifecycle, for instance. If you would like to provide uh, classes of, you know, like a business delegate classes to the client, I will put it in a dedicated project called API, for instance, or uh, know, API is a, is a generic term, um, some, what the project is doing. I don't know, ordering uh, API or just ordering. So something in domain within the name. And the client will have to import the, uh, the jar and the server will be dependent on the jar as well. This could be one approach. And what would be the con uh, the uh, the ingredients of the jar would be um, um, DDOs, could be J uh, JPA entities, and uh, of course, exceptions and all the parameters which are necessary to communicate with the server back and forth. But I will never call this util. If you call something util, it's like the term is too generic, it's a kitchen sink, you can put whatever you like and it is always okay. So I think it was a huge mistake in Java, in JDK, that Sun called, uh, introduced the util package. If you look at the util package right now, everything is there. So from collections to dates to logs, everything is a util package. Okay, next question, question number four. What is the best way to implement my own data sources um, for, uh, for database connections, for database connection? The question is a little bit strange, but I had to do it twice, different database, once for DB2 and the other in another project for Oracle. Um, actually, more than twice, uh, but uh, at least for the two databases. Why we had to do this, it was an um, uh, uh, insurance-like company and, and there was a bank. And the problem was, if you are using the data source or, 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 or something from connection pool, which communicates with the backend system, the, <laughs> the problem is that, um, that um, in the, the database only sees the resource user. This is the resource user which, um, with which the uh, uh, connection was uh, created. So in the case of Glassfish, they opened the... Um, the uh, admin console, if I go to um, additional properties, you would just see the user app, which communicates uh, the whole time with the with the backend of the user app is the resource user has nothing to do with the real user. So, and my requirement was to pass the real user to the backend, how to do this. So what we did, we start the principle in thread local and we decorated the actual uh, data source implementation. The question is, how, how to know what is actually the, the real data source. If you look at this, it's the client data source in the, in, the, um, in the case of Derby. So what I would do right now, if I will have to, ex to enhance, for instance, Derby, I would check out the source code from the Derby database, this uh, Apache project, dbapache.org, I think. You can um, clone the, the repository, look at the implementation, enhance the implementation. And what we did is we implemented the actual data source and we passed uh, everything to the Oracle data source and uh, we, we created a decorator 
and uh, the decorator manipulates the real data source. So we enhanced the uh, Oracle driver and registered our own driver to the um, to um, to the application server. By the way, there is um, an old driver. It's called um, P6 Spy. Hopefully, it still exists. Yes, and um, this is also interesting. So look, look at P6 Spy. It is an empty JDBC driver. And uh, what it actually does, it wraps uh, a connection and it's able to lock all the interactions with the backend. You could do something similar for data sources and then you can do whatever you like. And uh, what I, if it's not about data source, but uh, something legacy, I would look at um, connectors and I actually implemented a JCA connector for Java E6. Um, once it's called uh, what just deals with the threats, which is no more necessary in Java E7 because we have um, how it's called uh, concurrency utilities for Java E. And the next part is um, uh, what I also implemented, a connector which accesses uh, files in transactional way. So um, two are implemented. I hope question is answered. The fifth one is a little bit trickier. So I had um, uh, interactions with Patrick uh, today morning about this. So um, the question is how to solve database passwords. And um, so as, uh, if I read the, uh, the, the, the question directly, you would, you would assume um, Patrick attempts to, uh, to, to, to communicate with, directly with the database and bypassing the data source. Um, and this is actually uh, not as it should be used. You should always use the data source from the application server, but then you don't have the, uh, to, 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 to communicate um, don't you directly with the connection rather than you are using always the data source. So there is no way to pass the password to the database because the, the application server is using the resource user. But um, what Patrick would like to do is, Patrick would like to use uh, own authentication mechanism. So you would like to pass username and password to the database. And I think a better approach would be to encapsulate this in a security realm. So what it means, you will pass the username and password to the security realm, and the security realm will uh, would, um, would 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 care about salting. And to implement a security realm is not that hard, actually. In the um, in the um, um, case of of Glassfish or JBoss, you there are only view classes which just fetch uh, you know uh, the user, the, um, sorry, the principal, and and associate the principal with the roles. And I wrote a very simple or simple short article on Java magazine. It is called Java E Security. And this article just explains how to use the uh, security realm and uh, to make it saltable, you will have to enhance it. And there are several resources in the internet how to use um, a security realm with salt. But um, if you wouldn't like to implement your own security realm and just use uh, any kind of salting. What I would do, I will um, I will implement this in a simple jar, test it, and then include the jar in a war. This would be a, one of the view examples where actually having a module which is standalone makes sense because probably you would like to share this module with uh, different other applications. And this is very simple and generic functionality and highly reusable. And you could even put you know the, the module on GitHub, why not? Okay, um, I think the uh, question is covered. So now, um, interesting one about the BCE pattern. And the question was why, um, so I created an, um, a sample application called workshops. <laughs> so I tried to, um, I thought what I can build with a little bit business logic. So what I did, I recreated a workshops um, AHEX um, registration mechanism just to have a little bit of business logic. And I published this as a BCE or ECB entity control boundary uh, pattern. And I will just show you what it actually does. So I will create the... Um, a project from scratch, and this is going to be um, application from archetype. Come AIHAX. BC archetype is the recent one, and I think it is, I don't even know, so go with this. Uh, BCE. So it fetches the uh, definition from Maven Central, and, and, and the question was, um, I used, I had two classes, registrations resource uh, registrations resource and registration and the question is why 
And um, so if you look at this, the, in Baudrillard, you have two classes, registration, which just uh, cares about the registration, and registration's resource, which has something to do with, um, uh, with JAXRS. And the question is, wh why I created two classes and not single one? And uh, the answer is a little bit in the register method. If you look at the method, there's lots of going on with JAXRS. Info, get absolute path, build a path. Then I create strange JSON objects. And um, if I would like to test this method, or if I had any business logic in the method, I will have to test the register method. And then I will have to mock out all the JAXRS stuff, which is way too, too, too much, actually, to just to test the business logic. And this is why I always separate the uh, the protocol classes from the pure implementation and will only always find um JAXRS resources separated from the actual business logic and yeah but no interface nothing is just you know straight injection this is why i'm doing this i'm doing this always and um, even in most simplistic cases you would usually like to 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 uh, return back a response not the actual class you know just to say whether it is created uh, 201 or uh, http code 200 you will have to return the response and then it is harder to test okay i think we covered this next one given the uncertain future of glassfish which application server i would recommend so uncertain future of glassfish so there is one company called lodge on and they provide commercial support for glassfish and um and they are i would say passionate java developers so i know johan foss uh, from uh, from several conferences this guy is crazy works night and day and speaks java and um they providing commercial support for Glassfish and I would say high quality commercial support. So if you have a question, you probably get an answer from them. And uh, another one is uh, C2B, oh, C2B2, I think there are, yes. And this is a company from London, and they um, uh, they uh, pr provide you um, commercial support for Glassfish as well. Also high quality, also crazy guys, and crazy means positively crazy. So we have already two companies which provide um, commercial support for Glassfish. So uh, I would say the future is not that uncertain, and uh, what Oracle stated several times, Glassfish 5 will come. So, but also, also noteworthy. Um, I had some uh, discussions or, or arguments uh, back on my blog about uh, whether support, um, let's see whether I will find it, commercial support Adam Bean. Um, so, um, and there are some discussions in the blog about commercial support and um, and uh, uh, application servers, and uh, what, what I what I what I got what the feedback was no one cares about the commercial support so uh, no one buys it is not necessary, and um, I was in completely different opinion. But what happened right now? Oracle cancelled the commercial support for Glassfish, and um, I would say many of my clients moved to Wi-Fi. So um, so what it means. I was actually right, sadly. So uh, people do care about the commercial support. At least they care um, about commercial support. If they really have, have trouble, they would buy it. So this is uh, I would. This is the, um, the the attitude I, I experienced in project. And the, and the problem with Glassfish was no one no, knew about the uh, commercial support. So I think the the uh, Oracle salesman didn't did a great job with this because uh, lots, most of my clients didn't even knew that they buy something for Glassfish. So um, this was probably a, a, a problem with Glassfish. So, um, but then if, um, if you would like or have to migrate away from Glassfish, where you would migrate to? So um, my first choice would be Whitefly. So White Whitefly is similar to Glassfish. It comes with command line interface, which is uh, REST, based on REST, very similar to AS Admin. So you can uh, deploy the um, applications with feedback. So we'll get feedback back whether I actually create also a blog post. So uh, JBoss CLI Adamine. 
um so it is uh, very easy to 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 use it so it's like you can just deep, it's very similar to to, to glassfish actually and it comes with uh, admin interface and it comes with some shared components from glassfish for instance the weld the cdi dependency injection is actually glassfish one of course hibernate validator um jpa is different so um they they are using hibernate and not eclipse link but in some projects we migrated uh eclipse link to a whitefly and it still worked Okay, this was the first one. Uh, Tommy, also interesting. The problem with Tommy is there is no CLI uh, and there is uh, not yet, and there is no um, Java 7 support. They are working on this, but it will come soon. Then Tommy would be very interesting because Tommy from outside looks like Tomcat. So I integrated Tommy to um, to NetBeans as Tomcat and was able, you know, to deploy the application. So that's already very good, well integrated, and some companies having. If you have Tomcat in production, you can you can just uh, you know enhance it um, with Java E, and then you have Tommy. And uh, the secret weapon is WLP. And um, what it is? WebSphere. I would suggest you WebSphere. This is very strange. But what I tried out is WLP Web Celebrity Profile, and this is a totally different beast than the full featured WebSphere. It comes with a single jar. And you can just execute this with Java minus jar. You can download and execute it, and you get something like a white flower glassfish, very lightweight, very fast application server with Java 6, 6 support. So if you have uh, any IBM licenses or IBM products in house, WLP would be also interesting. So this would be application servers I would suggest you. Okay. Next one. Do you recommend overriding uh, equals method given that is? doesn't work when comparing weld proxies to real objects? Interesting question. So first of all, I would like to draw something for you. And um, so how it works, you have a client and the um, the uh, this could be an EJB, for instance, and this could be a CDI object, and the CDI object is injected to the EJB with at inject. The question is, what happens behind the scenes? And what happens is the following: what usually the co uh, the uh, container does, it um, creates a subclass, oh, wrong direction, creates a subclass of the real POJO, and this class is the proxy. And the proxy knows how to communicate back to, uh, to the real class. So what is actually injected is usually the proxy and not the POJO. So what it actually means is, it means that uh, what, 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 you, what you are dealing with is a subclass of your real class usually, or a bytecode extended class. And this is another instance of the class. So you get two instances, a proxy instance and the real instance. This is the first. And uh, if you if you implement equals, the question is, is the proxy equal to the real class or it isn't? And um, I actually don't know why it matters, because um, it would only matter if you would attempt to do entity beans, JPA classes, uh, managed objects. Then you will have to compare keys or something like this. But usually, CDI are treated like services in Java 6. And then you actually don't have to compare them. The only reason I would think of is if you inter implement your own scope. If you implement your own scope, it would be probably nice to compare the objects whether they are already in scope or not using equals. But usually, you would use uh, the uh, equals equals you know um, operator just to compare whether they are the same or not. So um, the question is why you would like. What is the problem not implementing the equals? I actually, never implemented the equals, which doesn't say anything. But I don't even understand the problem. Okay, then next one, next question. Um, JSF two two is early days to support HTML five. I wouldn't say this. Um, HTML five is already really well supported. So we just close some tabs. So, and this is the um, the um, Oracle page, um, which um, explains the um, HTML5 support for JSF. And what's interesting, what you can could do 
you could uh, write code like this and what it means is input type for instance email and now JSF ID email and what's important is here um, to make an element that's not a JSF element a pass-through element specify at least one of its attributes using the namespace so if you specify at least one attribute here with the namespace JSF it becomes an element the question is which one and it depends here on uh, you see here here input input with the type email it is this one becomes h input text so you can just work with standard html5 markup and the standard html5 markup will be is converted behind the scenes uh, to facelets tags uh, for you so it just works out of the box and then you have all the power of html5 the problem is let's see whether i will find the um the old post the problem is uh, what's uh, what's um, js html5 introduces is semantic markup so actually what you would like to do is to have you know spe specific meaning for nav article section and aside and uh, then you will count on the component providers that they will use the html5 markup properly so um, the suggestion here is um, what, I sh what, what should happen in JSF in my eyes is it would be to introduce a kind of structure to the component provider. So they say, look, you know, uh, there should be, a, if you are building a navigation bar, use the nav tag, for instance. Then it will be more, uh, more responsive. Right now you can, uh, the component providers like Prime Faces or Rich Faces or whoever could just, uh, just use diffs and nothing else. And uh, then you will be hard time to create responsive web design uh, pages. What is responsive web design? It's a page which um, the uh, UI or layout adapts to the clients automatically, usu usually using techniques like media queries. So, um, and uh, relative uh, size um, uh, uh, size settings. So you, you are not using pixels rather than EMs or percent. And um, shameless plug, this is actually what we discuss in the HTML5 um, day, and um, <laughs> what's also funny on Thursday, I will introduce your uh, uh, web frameworks like uh, Vardin JSF, and on Friday, I will explain you who, um, why sometimes such frame frameworks cannot work. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, interesting days. But on the HTML5 day, we discuss the responsive web design and what the actual problems are. And the problems are sometimes you need the access to the bare metal, to the HTML5 markup. And regardless which technology you are using, um, it becomes uh, not that productive because uh, JSF, Vardin, GWT, and all the frameworks are generating HTML code for you. But if you need a total control of HTML code, uh, su such uh, frameworks are just, you know, um, sl slow you down. So it really depends on what you would like to do. But you can achieve a lot with HTML5 and JSF22 right now. And um, Bootstrap style best practices, you can still do it with JSF. If the structure is clean and you have nice classes, you have some thoughts uh, about the structure, classes, semantic markup, you can absolutely use, uh, use Bootstrap, for instance. And what is recommended practice to ensure responsive web design? Actually, in JSF, no difference to, uh, to practice in HTML5, but you have to be aware of the generated code. So if you, if you have to use prime faces, rich faces, ice faces, or whatever, um, omni faces, what you will have to do is you will have to look at the markup, whether the markup is semantic, whether you will find, you know, in navigation bar, footer or header or whatever. And then if you will find them easily, you can create your own media queries and adapt the layout to your needs. Okay. So what I thinking about JustPick, Java authorization, uh, what is this Java authentication uh, um, for containers? And uh, why do you never use it in your examples? I also never use Jack, Java authorization container contract. So there is, um, jcp.org page and the JSR 115 is Jack Java authorization uh, contract for containers and uh, what it actually specifies is, is the layer how the uh, principles are uh, created and the roles and how the roles in web XML are mapped to the real ones so you can if you're creating your custom security you could look at this also with salting you can you can you could en enhance this and the JustPeak is about um, messaging and authentication. 
and uh, oh, there is nothing. Let's see, JCP, JCP, just pick. And um, it is actually, it is a specification about um, HTTP, GMS, SOAP, authentication using messaging. And um, this pack is fairly thin. It's about 170 pages, uh, really well uh, um, uh, described. And this is if you, if, you, if you would like to create your own custom authentication, just pick this. What's my opinion on this? Actually, um, it's something which I do not implement you know, in each project. This is why I don't have a lot of experience with JustPeak. I implemented JustPeak once and Jack twice on different application servers. And um, these packs are well written. So if you read these packs and implement it, it is fairly obvious what to do. And um, yeah, so um, if you need custom authentication, go for JustPeak. This is what, uh, um, what my opinion is. And uh, you wouldn't see it in my examples because um, if I'm just you know creating this uh, once or two to my clients, it is harder to recreate this in a clean room implementation after the work. And this is not a lot of fun for me to do it in my leisure. So um, this is actually the reason, but there's nothing behind this. Um, I hope, I hope it is clear. So just because it can be perfectly usable is Java 6, Java 7, you can use it right now. Okay, um, this was just speak. Is there a good way to, to debug concurrency locks? Um, first, don't use synchronize modifier rather than use, um, for instance, re-entrant, re re-entrant, read, write lock in Java. So if you use uh, lock classes like this from the Java util concurrent locks package, um, it just looks like this. So you will have to, to declare the lock here and then uh, in lock and and uh, read lock becomes a regular method so you can set a breakpoint here so if you set a breakpoint you can profile this and you can easier search for problems this is a trick in the past we debugged or profiled such problems with uh, mission control and there is a, the flight recorder is a great tool but um, it is commercial i don't know about the license cost but it's a commercial one but it's really great it doesn't slow, slow down uh, slow down uh, slow down the system another interesting uh, commercial product is called chronon systems and the chronon systems create something like uh yeah like a dvr for java they record the whole stack trace the whole stack and you can reply what happens over and and over again, and even you can insert some logging statements, a really interesting um, application. Okay, so um, the next one. Uh, example, how to connect with uh, from Java X to Java E backend with RESTful Web Services. Quick answer is no difference between Java X or, and Swing or, or, or system tests, but I implemented back, um, um, some years ago uh, this in project called Lightfish and Lightview is the JavaFX frontend of the project. And if you go to the services uh, tab, there is an escalation fetcher which uses the JaxRS client to fetch the escalation. So there's a simple method get escalation. There's esc um, escalation provider which wraps this in a task and makes it asynchronous. So in Java 7, I will code it a little bit differently because Java 7 comes with uh, asynchronous clients out of the box. This would be one of my next tasks to make it asynchronous. Uh, but in the script manager, for instance, I can register a new script using um, using put and XML. So I'm just wrapping the JaxRS client and exposing the script manager something like a business delegate back then. And the project is the, my um, GitHub project, and it's called Lightfish. Where is it? Where is the fish? Lightfish. So if you clone the project, you get the example. I think it's pretty straightforward. Also, also, I created a short video starting with JaxRS client, so you can look at the video. So six minutes, how to start with JaxRS to O client. And if you wrap the client with, with a single class, you can use it from J JavaFX, Wink, or whatever you like. So what is the best way um, to handle large files? And 20 megs at least, and with uh, they can get larger and if they um, a few hundred of users so let's say it will be 1000 users 20 max it would mean uh 20 gigs i think right 
Um, let's say 30 gigs. Um, then still, I bought 24 gigabyte of RAM for 180 euros recently. Uh, uh, you would saturate uh, one server with this, um, so it is not. It, it isn't end of the world. So um, if you think about this, you can you can keep everything in memory and it will still work, and you will have to spend 180 euros. But the question is going, okay, the, the, the uploading video files, so it they can be significantly larger than 20 max. What happens if the if the file is, you know, 20 gigs? Then there is no way to, to keep them in memory. What I would do then? Streaming. So I would uh, always use streaming. So how to what it actually means, you should use on the client and on the server input stream, output stream, but never JSON object or an, an entity class, because then the data is going to be deserialized or serialized to a Java object instance. And this is, um, and this uh, will take a lot, um, they will take a lot of memory. So this is the, the, the problem with this. And um, so um, how to do this? The question is, okay, fine, I'm uploading from a stream, so it is really easy to do it. Actually, I will probably record uh, another screencast because I'm implementing it right now. Uh, I'm streaming a file via JAXRS service, which is really easy. So I only have to put, you know, expect an input stream as a parameter and it will just work. Where to put it? Because if you if you create a file on the server, the file will live in a local file system. If you are cluster, you're already in trouble. So um, one idea would be to use something like Cassandra Cassandra is very, very good in writing large files, and and, and it uh, already would uh, would replicate the the data in cluster. So I would use something like Cassandra to write directly to to data store. You could, of course, use relational databases, or of course, just use a connector. So if you look at um, my connectors implementation, you could um, enhance the connector implementation. So you could just write, you know, not byte array rather than a string, just write a string directly to the store and the string could be an, a string a stream directly to the store and this could be a cassandra store and if you have lots of memory i would use something like hazelcast or infinispan to keep everything in memory but um i would separate you know the store like cassandra hazelcast from the objects and they should not even attempt to deserialize the object into memory because then i would be in trouble so i would say um 20 meg XML file could be expanded in memory to uh, probably even to a few hundred megabyte of RAM. Okay, and the last question, why Maven lifecycle hooks are problematic? So in a recent workshop, someone asked me, um, uh, you mentioned something, don't use uh, uh, Maven lifecycle hooks, why, why not? And uh, the answer is simple. So if I go to uh, any Maven project and say here, clean and build, what happens, Maven performs uh, Maven clean install and this should be fast. So this is already uh, uh, slow, but what happens behind the scenes, it creates a single, it, it packs all the dependencies, creates one single jar for JavaFX. So this is uh, six seconds are already too slow. And if I would create, um, set up lifecycle hooks for face safe uh, integration tests and for uh, quality control like Sonar, it will probably take several minutes or even several, several hours. So um, in my eyes, you should never use lifecycle hooks rather than uh, create um, several jobs on your uh, in your CI environment, like for instance Jenkins or Hudson, and uh, each job will execute a single uh, a Maven Maven step or uh, um, how it's called um, Maven phase uh, instead. Oh, sorry, and plugin actually. So that's a Maven phase safe integration test, and uh, you will chain the jobs uh, together. Why why is important to do this? Because if you if you do it this way. Uh, what you what you will get is um, you get a faster feedback because you will see okay um, uh, unit tests are finished integration tests are finished um, and now uh, the application is deployed on the application server if you create a huge monolithic Maven you will have to one hour to get a feedback okay thank you sorry for the non interactive style today but it was uh, easier to me to you know to go through all the questions again than or easier more fun then you know spend time with uh, corrupted files and and editing and um, yeah see you in one of upcoming uh, workshops um, so at munich airport so this is um, the schedule and um, there will be also a bunch of workshops in in december 
And um, particularly, I will, uh, I'm, what I'm really looking for, forward is in October workshops about combining Java 8 with Java 7. Particularly, you now you can do some tricks eliminating JPA or just using Hazelcast and stuff, just playing with Java 8 possibilities. And uh, probably I get lots of requests about Java e, uh, testing and quality, like Archelian and all the stuff I got. Um, um, so probably I will uh, initiate another workshop as well this year. So see you of upcoming conferences, Java 1. I will be there the whole week. So if you have any questions, go come to Java 1. We can, we can have a milk <laughs> and uh, discuss um, uh, uh, and have a chat about Java and related stuff. And probably I will record something on Java, Java 1, who knows? And uh, yeah, see your upcoming conferences, workshops, or even the hacks. And uh, each first Monday of the month at 6 p.m. CET, see you here in live stream. Thank you. Bye.